came back specifically to the class and then had to see that again. So you're stuck with me for today. Um, but what's nice about today is that most of the stuff that I'm going to be talking to you about today is actually my stuff. So I can actually answer questions about it, uh, unlike most other topics. Uh, <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions before we get started? Questions about the homework, questions about the other lecture yesterday. Yeah. The, um, about the homework. Yeah. The uh, weights on the basis yep. G, mm -hmm. what sort of initialization yeah. should we use for that? So I, what's that initial value? Yeah. So finding the initial value was actually the hardest part of the problem. Oh, right. The, 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 okay. the um, someone took, someone stole all the markers. Um, so, if you remember, there are basically three equations that, uh, that determine the model. Um, so, uh, the sensitivity on trial n at some error, e of n, is a function of e of n, not multiplied by e of n, is equal to the sum uh, over i for all, say, n basis sets, <coughs> or n basis, um, w i times g of i of e of n, right? Where g i of e of n is just a standard Gaussian basis, right? The exponent uh, minus uh, e on trial n minus some u, some mean e squared divided by 2 sigma squared, right? So you can imagine that you have some space so you have some space, some error space. Here's zero error. Here's one. Uh, here's two minus one minus two. Th this has arbitrary units, um, right? But for for the homework, I'm just giving you plus one and minus one errors, or plus one perturbations and zero perturbations, right? Um, but you can imagine this is in a real case if you're making reaching movements. This could be centimeters. It's whatever your error. Is. But in, in the case of the homework, it's just arbitrary. And you have bases here, right, that are centered at some particular muse. You choose how many bases you want, right? So you have bases that span the, the air space, whose height initially is some value w naught, right? And so your question was, what is this value w naught? And so I am not giving you the value of w naught. What I am telling you is that for all errors, if you sum up the sensitivity, or if you sum up all of the bases at every single one of the errors, you should end up with a constant sensitivity equal to 0 0.1, 10%. So that's the, the naive learner. That's the naive learner. Before they've even seen, gotten any feedback. Before they've gotten any errors. What, so just like so in part A of the homework, we arbitrarily set Eta to be equal to 10 percent, right? What that means is that when you see a one unit error, when you see an error that is equal to one arbitrary unit, on the next trial you change the output of the system to compensate for 10 percent of that error. So you now your output is, you know, 0.1. On the, on the next trial it's going to be just less than 0.2. Right? So you exponentially approach the uh, estimating that perturbation. So that the naive learner that does not change their error sensitivity it has a fixed error of 0.1, right? You, your naive learner, is initially going to have uh, a sensitivity to error of 0.1, but that sensitivity to error is going to change as a function of the history of the, of the errors. Does that make sense? So the way that I would do it, you can actually, so w naught is going to be a heck of a lot smaller than um, 0.1, right? And it depends on how many bases you have. If you have 15 bases spanning this space, right, it's going to be really, really small. Right? If you have 100 bases, it's going to be even smaller. right? Each of the, because you need to sum up each of the individual values of the Gaussians. So the way you can actually figure it out based on how wide the, the Gaussians are, the width of the Gaussians. But to be honest, the easiest way to do it is choose the value of, of uh, Choose your eta value, 0.1, I'm giving it to you in this case. 
start with a W that's very, very small, zero basically, and just add tiny amounts to it until the sum of all the Gaussians is equal to 0.1. Does that make sense? So you could it, you can iteratively do it. It's a it's a hack. Oh, okay. Right. So W is com W I is constant over I. Yeah. W I yeah. is constant or in, initially, but then now you've learned it's going to be constant right. over I. Well, so gotcha. could, could you could you have an initialization where they're not constant but still gives you 0.1 within your range of errors? Could you have? Yeah, they space even. Yeah, yeah, if they were not spaced evenly, or if they were spaced on top of each other, and, and no, well, I th even if they're spaced evenly, you could have you could have weights that vary that they just cancel out and get 0.1. I don't. I'm assuming that you could still do that without them all being locked at the same. Because you know, um, I, I didn't lock. Because I started homework, I didn't lock the value as the WI being the same for all. You, yeah, you don't have a solution that, that is a flat that. line. The it's answer is going to be the same regardless. Okay. Uh, the easiest thing to do, I would say, is fix all of the W's to be the same. Yeah, that means essentially just solve the squares to do that. Yeah, I mean that uh, exactly. So you can you can do exactly that. You can find the weights to be at least squares. So you can solve it, but I just do it hacky. Right. Um, yeah. I have another question about the plots that you asked for. So we're plotting the magnitude of the error against the against eta times the error. Against exactly learning from error in this particular case. Yeah. Remember, so so in the simplest learning rule, x of x hat of n plus one or y is for, in this case they're going to be the same because x hat is going to be equal to y hat. So x hat of n plus one is equal to x hat of n plus eta right, times y minus, which I'll call here, true x on trial n minus x hat on trial n, right? So, eta is your sensitivity to error. Right, it represents how much you're going to learn, the fraction of the error that you're going to account for on the next trial. This term here represents learning. How much do you learn on each trial? So what I'm really asking you to do is plot this term, right, for all possible errors. So over the span of the error space. So you're going to have a set of bases. Right? You're going to have a set of bases. Some of that, some of the bases are going to have oh, higher and lower weights than others. And I want you, for every one of these errors, to go through and just tell me what the sensitivity value is. At the end of the trials. At the, trials. End, at the yeah. end of all the trials. Okay. Right. At, so after you expose the learner to each one of the environments, uh -huh. just go through and say, oh, what's the sensitivity? What's the learning from error? Which is find the sensitivity and multiply it by minus 2 for minus 2. What is the sensitivity to error? Well, minus 1 multiply it by minus 1. Yeah. Does that make sense? And then. Um, So, yeah, okay. In the first case, right, this is why I had to do it in the simplest case. Right, silly, right. Yeah. right. It, it's, it, what is it? What is learning from error in the, in the first case with a fixed eta value of 0.1? Tenth of, a, of the error. It, it's, it's a tenth of the error, so what is it? It's a, what, it, what would it look like if I plotted, I plotted error on this axis and this is a to e? What, what, what does it look like? A line. It's a line. That passes through. No, it's a line that passes through the origin, whose slope is 0.1. So when you say magnitude, you don't mean magnitude, like the, like not absolute value of error. No. Okay. Did I say magnitude? In the homework, I think it says magnitude. Oh, I said magnitude? Well, you can plot the absolute value. It's going to look the same. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Okay. But it's a line with a slope of 0.1. It's not a horizontal line at 0.1. It's a line with a slope of 0.1. Does, does it make sense? The sensitivity, eta, is a line with a slope at 0.1. But eta times e 
is not that. It's a, it's a line, E, right, with unit value to multiply by A. Okay? Does that clear it up? Yes. I apologize, but the, I created the homework literally 10 minutes before class. <laughs> uh, so uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them um, and revise the homework appropriately. It shouldn't be too bad. The, it shouldn't be too bad. The, fir the first problem should take you like 10 minutes. Um, the second problem might take you a little bit longer. But the way I would look at it is, remember, beta represents how much things are changing on every trial. The way I would do it initially is set up all your stuff, set beta equal to zero, and it should look exactly like the, the part A. Does that make sense? It should look exactly the same. Okay. So, any other questions? Okay. So, we talked, I just erased the equation, but I'll, I'll write it again. So, the, the simplest possible learning um, learning rule Right, so the simplest possible learning rule is we, we'll call this a one state rule. You are estimating some state x, right? Uh, and to make it even more clear, I'm going to change these values to y's. This is going to be y and y hat. And we're going to say y hat is equal to c uh, x hat on trial end, right? where, where c is equal to 1. So just to be clear, you're observing some true output. You have some estimated output. And you change the estimate of your state based on um, the observed values that you're getting. And the amount that you change it is based on the value of data, the sensitivity. Okay, um, so this predicts very nicely some, some um, psychophysical results. Imagine that if you had a, um, a perturbation, so this is perturbation on the y-axis and trial on the x-axis. So imagine that you had no perturbation for a little while, right? and then you suddenly turn on the perturbation. You abruptly turn on the perturbation. Well, I don't know what this perturbation is. It could be pushing your hand to the left. It could be rotating the environment. It could be some perturbation. Um, turns out that, that people do a, a good job at learning this. And the way and their learning curves look like uh, exponents, exponential curves. So you get incrementally better and better and better and better and better until you finally reach some steady state value which may or may not be equal to, exactly equal to the perturbation. Some people tend to uh, have a little bit less than, than the perturbation. You, you fully compensate for about 95% of the perturbation, depending on what perturbation you do. Um, but interestingly enough, there are some, there are a lot of phenomena that this simple model can't, um, cannot uh, describe. So one of the earliest experiments, let me tell you, this is chapter eight, by the way, in Dresden's book. Um, so this is uh, Ross uh, in 1968, so long ago. Um, this experiment is 1968. Uh, is actually not in the book, but this is the first example of this phenomenon that I was able to find. What, what they did was they had rabbits, um, 24 albino female rabbits. Um, and they have a, a condition stimulus, um, so I'll call it CS, which is a tone. They, they hear a tone, they play a tone. And an unconditioned stimulus, which is a, a shock uh, to a little electrode that's in the eyelid. Um, and so when, when, the, um, when the rabbit gets shocked, they blink, right? And so what they do is they pair, so initially you just hear a tone, the, the, the rabbits just hear tone, tone, tone. They, they don't blink, right? They never have no reason to blink. So you just play tone, 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 tone. The rabbits do, you know, what the heck they want to do. Um, at some point in time, you pair um, the tone and the shock together, right? And just like Reza talked about when we talked about uh, Kim and blocking, um, they begin to learn um, the pairing of the tone and the shock. So that if the tone is ever presented by itself, you get some percentage of the rabbits that are going to respond by, by 
like blinking their eye, even though no shock was presented. So after you do about you know, 50 pairings of tone plus shock, you know, about 85% of the rabbits uh, at the end of this pairing blink their eye when they hear the tone alone. Okay. So, so they learn as a percentage of the, uh, of the rabbits in the environment. Most of them learn to, to pair the tone and shock together. Okay. Then what you do is you wash out. You have a period of washout in which you remove the, the shock and instead present just tones. So here was just tones as well. So tone, tone plus shock, and tone again. So what happens now is that initially the, the rabbits, you know, you hear the tone and they're blinking. Um, but over time, they, with the tone not being paired with the shock, they, they realize that, oh, that, you know, I don't have to blink anymore. And so over time, over a number of trials, the, they stop blinking. Right? And so after about 50 trials of this just tone, um, basically, none of the of the rabbits um, uh, blink anymore when they hear a tone. But what happens when you re-expose them to the tone plus the shock is that they learn the pairing, same pairing. They've washed out completely. They now do not respond to the tone alone, right? But they, when as soon as they uh, see a tone plus a shock, they learn quite a bit faster. So in many less trials than it took them to learn the pairing initially, they now respond at the, same, at the same level as a percentage. Does that make sense? So clearly, this simplistic model cannot account for that result, right? You have an eta value which is fixed for all trials, right? And so you expose the model to this pairing of zeros and ones, you know, zero being no perturbation, one being the tone and the shock, and it will learn at some rate and then it will decay at some rate, right? And then it will learn again, but it will learn at exactly the same rate it learned before. Does that make sense? So this phenomenon is called savings. So savings is basically learning a perturbation A, followed by washout. Or extinction. Okay, I spelled that right. But, and then faster relearning of A. Does that make sense? So that's savings. Um, so to give you a, a couple of couple more examples. So Yoshiko Kojima. Um, back in 2004, recorded some interesting data from monkeys. This is now in the book again. Um, so the, what they performed is called an intrapsychotic step paradigm. So basically what they have the monkey do is the monkey fixates a point on the screen. Okay. And then another point appears over to one side. Say this is 10 degrees. The monkey, so the monkey is fixated here, another target appears, and the monkey is trained to look at, to make, basically make a rapid eye movement to the, that second target, and it's called a saccade. So the monkey is trained to rapidly make an eye movement over here. And we are tracking very closely the eye movements of the monkey. Now importantly, when you make a saccade, when you make a, a fast eye movement, you're basically blind during the period of, of the saccade. So uh, while you're moving, while your while your eyes are moving, you basically don't get any visual feedback. So it's sort of a it's a very ballistic movement. And so when the monkey starts to look at the target that's 10 degrees away, so in that very brief period that they're moving their eye, we take away the target that we had presented them and instead present a target that's further away. So they end up looking initially on that first trial exactly 10 degrees away. So they're looking there, but they realize, hey, I fell short, right? I was supposed to be looking at the target, and there's this two degrees of error on the first trial, right? So we, we trick them a little bit. Humans do it too, I mean, it's a, I mean. So we trick them a little bit by basically jumping the target on them while they can't see, okay? And so what happens is, this is called an intrapsychotic step paradigm, 
What happens is, over a large number of trials, the monkeys <coughs> learn that a 10 degree saccade is not a 10 degree saccade. It's a 12 degree saccade. And so you start off, um, say this is a gain of one, so I'm plotting gain on the uh, y-axis, and here's a gain of 1.4, um, and this is trial. So you start off in a period where you don't jump the target at all, and so the, the gain is pretty close to one. When you ask the monkey to make a 10 degree saccade, they make pretty much a 10 degree saccade. You then uh, turn on the perturbation, so basically you turn on the steps so in this case, I, I wrote 10 degrees. It's actually, uh, and, and we jump at 2 degrees. We actually jump at 4 degrees in this particular case, just to, which is how I get my 1.4 out of here. Okay. So the, the monkey slowly starts to, these are individual saccades on a given trial, slowly starts to learn the, the pairing. And so now, um, we'll say that you know at this point in time, they're sitting at about 1.4. Two degrees, so they still have a little bit of an error, but uh, um, but they've learned to make bigger saccades than what they were making before to the target. We then basically, instead of showing them exactly the target at ten degrees, we do the exact opposite, and we show them the target minus four degrees away, so uh, the target at six degrees instead of fourteen degrees. So we start, they start coming right back down. Right, and if we let them. If we left them in that environment, they would have a gain less than less than one. Does that make sense? But once we get to once they get back to baseline, a value of one, we turn the we turn the perturbation back the other way, and we start gaining them back up again. So this this is the a period called adaptation. This is extinction or washout, um, and then a period of readaptation. And so if you plot a line, the mean line, through the first period of adaptation, um, and the mean line between the second period of adaptation, um, what you'll see is that the slope of the line during the readaptation period is larger than the slope of the line during the adaptation period. Basically, they learn faster. Now, that's over the first approximately 150 trials. After 150 trials, they actually learn, is that how you show parallel? It's been a long time since geometry. Um, you actually learn at about the same speed that you were learning the paradigm before. So if you stick the monkeys, if you keep letting them go um, and learning to adapt to this 1.4 gain situation, they actually slow down their adaptation after about 150 trials, and they learn at exactly the same speed they were learning over here. Okay. Anyway, so this period here is the same as what we talked about over here. It's basically savings. Yeah. Is that surprising that it kind of they go back to their slowest? I'll, I'll talk about. I'll get to it at the end. Okay. Right. And do, you, do the extinction do the extinction slopes also follow the same pattern? The so if you do another extinction uh, after this, the second extinction will be faster. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone's done the experiment where they continue the extinction after this point. So if you were to extinguish this point beyond what you learned over here, beyond one, right there, oh, here, okay. yeah. um, there's no difference. Uh, there would be no difference in how fast you learn. You'd learn at exactly the same rate as you do here. Mm -hmm. It's only the fact that, you, uh, that you've seen this previously that you tend to slow. But I guess the fact, so I'm sorry, um, so if you do a second extinction period, does yeah. that also happen faster in the second time than it was the first time. So if you do a second extinction period, yes, it will go faster the second time than the first time. Yeah. I can't tell you whether or not it slows down. Whether, yeah, I don't right. think that anyone's done that experiment. Okay. Um, but yes, you will, you'll do a second extinction and you'll be faster. Okay. Okay. So you can actually do periods of uh, learning extinction, learning extinction, learning extinction, learning extinction. And over, over time, it becomes what we call a skill. Um, basically, you can turn it on and turn it off real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so you basically can learn in like one trial. Oh, I, I know how to do this already. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That takes many, many, many repetitions. But you can you can basically do that. Create a skill. Okay. Any anyone have any questions? No. Okay. So interestingly, the second thing that they did in this experiment 
is after they washed you out here, so after they have extinguished your memory and you have gained one again, what they did in the second version of this experiment is they exposed, um, or didn't expose, they basically left the room. They turned off all the lights in the room and left the room and let the monkey sit for 30 minutes. Okay? And came back and did the same interstichotic step paradigm. Turns out that if you, here's my 30 minute delay, what ends up happening is that the monkeys start quite a bit higher than when you left the room. They start by, make, by having a gain that's larger um, than the gain of one when you left the room. So if you just let the monkey sit there for 30 minutes, you, they come back and they have a gain of 1.1 instead of 1.0. You haven't done anything but leave the room, turn off all the lights. So they're not getting any feedback about their eye movements. This is a totally dark room. But if you just let them sit there, you'll come back and you'll test them and immediately they'll have a gain that's higher than that and what you like. This is called spontaneous recovery. And it's basically the recovery of a motor command, or the recovery of something that you learned previously in the absence of, of any sort of uh, feedback. Does that make sense? So you, you spontaneously recover this memory that you adapted to. You're not sitting down here. So clearly, this cannot describe that phenomenon either. Right? You, you expose the model here to the same series of perturbations, and I don't know if you, you let this be gain of one for a couple of trials, and when you come back, you're still going to have a gain of one. I mean, you're never going to have a gain of one. Okay. So spontaneous recovery and savings, two phenomena that cannot be accounted for by um, this simplistic model. So back in 2006, um, I'll move over here. Back in 2006, uh, Maurice Smith, along with Reza, so this is Smith et al., uh, 2006, uh, proposed a multi-state model. And the multi-state model is actually very straightforward. So this multi-state model can have many states. We'll talk about that in just a second. But in the simplistic case, it's going to have two states. So you have some x hat fast, which I'll denote with the f, equaling a f uh, times this is n plus 1 x hat fast n plus b fast times y on trial n minus y hat on trial n. Okay. And some x hat slow on n plus 1, a slow times x hat slow on trial n plus b slow y of n minus y hat of n. Okay? And y hat on trial n is simply the sum of the fast states on trial n and the slow states on trial n. Okay. Now, so what are these a and b parameters? Well, they assumed in this 2006 paper that in the fast state, you learn things very quickly, and so you have a very high error sensitivity term. I could write this as a, but it's the same thing. So you have a very high sensitivity term, but you don't retain what you learned for very long. And so AF here is small. In the slow state, you learn very slowly. And I'll provide an example of this in just a second. You learn very slowly, but as you learn things, you retain them for a longer period of time. So AS is closer to 1. So here, AS is greater than 0. Um, sorry, A F is greater than 0, which is uh, less than the slow state, which is less than 1. Okay, So in the fast state, I retain very little. In the slow state, I retain quite a bit from trial to trial. Basically, I remember what I was doing from trial to trial. However, the Bs do exactly the opposite. So in this case, Bs is slower than B fast, smaller than B fast. You learn more from error in the fast state. What does that look like? So if we have, again, this is going to be perturbation and motor output okay, on the x-axis and trial 
on the y-axis, what happens, let's imagine we initially start off with a null perturbation, no perturbation at all. Okay. Um, and then we turn on abruptly uh, a perturbation. Okay. So in the fast state, what happens is, initially on this trial you have an error of one, right? You predicted that nothing was going to happen, but in fact uh, you had a perturbation of one. And so the fast state learns very quickly. The fast state learns very quickly and then forgets very quickly. Okay. So this is x fast. Okay. The slow state learns very slowly but retains just about all of its information over time. Okay. So the total motor output, which I'll draw as a dotted line, the total motor output is the sum of these two states. So you initially start off fast and then sort of creep your way upward. Right? So it looks sort of like a, the exponential that we drew over there. In fact, it looks almost exactly like the exponential that we drew over there. It's a double exponential. So why is this important? Well, we just sort of made our original model somewhat more complicated. But what you can imagine happening, so imagine that we had now a period of extinction so I'm going to redraw this a little bit and say, here's my negative one perturbation. Okay. And trial is again on this axis. Okay. So here's my minus one perturbation, I have plus one perturbation. So if I do extinction training, basically I give you a minus one perturbation, the opposite perturbation, just like in the Kojima experiment, for a very brief period of time, and then null. What will happen is that fast state will come down very quickly and then begin to forget. Okay. The slow state, the slow state comes down very slowly. Okay. And the total motor output is the sum of these two states, which looks like it goes to zero. Right? Does that make sense? So the fast state came down very quickly, and even so quickly that it started to forget. The slow state is coming down too, but it comes down a lot slower than, uh, than the fast state. And so the sum of the two states looks like I have no perturbation. So I've, I've totally washed you out. I've done extinction exactly the same way that uh, the Kojima experiment did extinction with a game of one. Does that make sense? So what's interesting now is you can expose the model to an additional plus one perturbation. And notice what has happened here. The slow state, which took a very long time to ramp up to what it was before, is, and I'll draw it even more pronounced, because it should be you know, the same slope as that one. The slow state is nowhere near zero where it was when you started learning. Right? It's actually quite a bit bigger. And so what happens is the fast state learns the perturbation very quickly and begins to forget, but the slow state is already here. And so it begins learning the perturbation just as it did before. But now the sum of the two states looks much faster than it did initially. So this very simplistic model in which you now have two forms of two unknown states, a slow state and a fast state, the sum of which is my motor output, that accounts for the phenomenon of savings. That makes sense? So you basically have a memory of the perturbation that evolves very quickly that you forget over, over a very short period, and another memory of the perturbation that begins to ramp up slowly, but you retain that information uh, for a longer period of time. Yeah. Is that um, biologically plausible? Sure, and in fact, we'll talk about it in just a second. Um, so you can imagine that, so here we make artificial perturbations, right? We're rotating the environment or pushing on your arm or doing something like that. But you can imagine that there are perturbations that you learn over very long periods of time, years, um, and perturbations that you learn over a very short period of time, seconds to minutes. So to give you an example, 
um, of a perturbation that you might learn over a very slow um, period. Imagine that you're, you're growing, right? Uh, I mean, you're 12 years old, you know, you're growing six inches in a year. Um, you need to recalibrate your motor output over a long period of time, right? As, as your limbs grow longer, you reaching for things is not going to be exactly the same as you reaching for things when you were three inches short. Right? So you have this very slow buildup of a, basically a perturbation. You make errors and you need to correct for them just because your body is changing. But similarly, you can imagine very fast perturbation. You're walking up the stairs um, and your muscles become fatigued. So over a very short period of time, your muscles become fatigued um, and you need to change your motor output so that you get the same, you know, the same uh, power going up the stairs. And that perturbation is over a very short period of time but and doesn't last very long. Does that make sense? So you sit down for two minutes, you're no longer fatigued, right? So the perturbation, you learn the perturbation quickly and then the perturbation disappears just as quickly. So in a biological standpoint, and from, and, and it makes sense that parts of the brain would learn slower or faster than other parts of the brain. So in fact, um, most of this learning of perturbations is cerebellar dependent. So it relies on um, your cerebellum, which is in the back of your right underneath your brain. It's the oldest part of the brain. Uh, turns out that people who don't have a cerebellum can't learn uh, to adapt their movements. Um, and so the, the condition that uh, they have is called uh, cerebellar ataxia, um, in which usually when you're about 30 or 40, your cerebellum begins to degenerate. Um, and so they have all sorts of problems. Um, they have problems walking and, and moving and stuff like that. But interestingly enough, they can't learn. So if you put them in an environment with a perturbation, they will not learn. Um, turns out that, um, so we know that there's something relies on, that these memories rely on the cerebellum. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, if you look at the rabbits that we talked about before, um, so a group, uh, Mike Mauck um, and Javier Medina have been studying rabbits for the last 40 years in the same uh, conditioned, unconditioned stimulus sort of paradigm, um, and looking specifically at parts of the cerebellum, turns out that the slow state uh, results in changes in synaptic plasticity in some of the nuclei in the cerebellum, where the fast state results in changes in at the cerebellar cortex. So you end up seeing changes in plasticity for these two different time scales in two different parts of the cerebellum. Does that answer your question? I know it was long-winded, but... Yeah. Okay. Um, something uh, else, uh, still uh, this uh, model won't be able to explain why if we have uh, uh, very frequent changes from uh, minus perturbation to blood perturbation, why we can adapt so fast to this system, right? This, this model does not account for that. That's yes. Correct. Yeah. So, no. is it easy to add an extra parameter to Sure, you would just change, you would add, change your, your, your fast state eta value um, in the way that Reza described uh, yesterday to account for that uh, result, uh, to account for the fact that sensitivity to error changes. We'll talk about it at the end, uh, another 10 minutes or so. Okay? Um, so this model also, um, also accounts for the spontaneous recovery uh, for exactly the same reasons. So if instead of uh, having this perturbation here, if you instead just stuck, uh, um, stuck the subject in a room in which they're getting no feedback, or what we do is, the way we model it is, we model these as something called error clamp trials, in which we basically force uh, y on trial n minus y hat on trial n to be equal to zero. Basically, we say, you made a perfect movement, you did everything just right, uh, even if you didn't. Uh, but we tell you that that's what you did. And so basically, you get no feedback about what you did. You just said, oh, that was good. Okay. And so what happens here is that the B terms drop out, right? Because this is zero. This is zero. The B terms drop out. And all you get is the A terms, which are strictly less than one. And so you end up, the states decay back to, back to zero. Does that make sense? So if instead of doing this, Right, you just stuck people in error clamp trials, which I'll denote as just two bars. What happens is the fast state uh, continues to decay. 
and the slow state goes back to zero. I, I'm sorry, here's the fast state. The fast state goes back to zero. The slow state is returning to zero, but much slower. And so in the error clamp trials, what you see is something that, notice the sum of these two things looks sort of like this. So this is the spontaneous recovery. So as the, the fast state decays quite a bit faster than the slow state, and so what eventually happens is the, you do end up coming down right, as the slow state decays. But you end up with this sort of peaked response, which in fact turns out to be exactly what you see in human subjects. So if you expose human subjects to either the intrapsychotic step experiment, um, in which you can give them error clamps, and to give you an error clamp, so remember we had that fixation point and we had that target that was 10 degrees away. And if you're if we gained you up, you're gonna you're gonna look and you're gonna make a saccade to 12 degrees. What we do is we just wait until your saccade is done, and the computers are fast enough nowadays that we just move the target over to exactly where you looked. Right. So we we notice where you stopped your saccade and we just we place the target there. Congratulations, you made it to the target. Does that make sense? So you can force people, regardless of the gain of the, the saccade that they have, to have zero error. And in that case, you just record how large their saccades are. In that case, you end up with curves that look exactly like this. They recover spontaneously to have a, a gain that's greater than one. Does that freak people out of a computer like that is like follow like you know a, if a computer knew where I was looking everywhere I looked like a little dot that followed out that would freak me out. Come in, do an experiment. I mean, we do. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, there, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really freak anyone out. You can't tell, right? You, you're blind during the saccade, so you can't tell that I moved the, the, the dot, right? Um, you said, oh, I must have done a great job. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So could you maybe, like, very, you said, like, 30 minutes in the dark room? Maybe you could, like, did you, I mean, I don't know if this is right with them, but, like, very, just, like, 10 to, like, 50 or something, and then okay. try to subtract off. So, so this is a paper by uh, uh, Chris Manga Heminger and Reza. It asked exactly the same question back in 2007, I think. Nope, 2009. So Jerry, you're only like four years late. Uh, so what they did in this particular experiment, they did exactly this, except they waited uh, different periods. So if you wait no time and just expose people to channel tries, you get something that looks like this, some rebound uh, right, that, that eventually decays. But if you wait uh, more time than that, if you wait two minutes, it looks pretty much the same. If you wait instead um, two hours, I'm sure I'm making it, uh, no, I'm sorry, if you wait ten minutes, it looks a little bit different. What happens is, um, you get significantly less spontaneous recovery, right? And instead, so imagine you had a group, just to give you the full experiment, instead of talking about it wishy-washy. Um, here's perturbations again. Okay. So group A does perturbation A, followed by extinction in B, and then testing in error clamp trials. Okay. So A followed by B, which I'll call A plus B. A second group just does A, and then goes into error clamp trials. Okay. So you have A and A plus B. So in A, if you look at immediately after, um, immediately after you learn A, Group A comes down a little bit. I'm not plotting fast in slow state. So if you just had A, A comes down a little bit. So this is A. And A plus B does exactly what you would think they do, the spontaneous recovery. Right. So this is after zero minutes. Okay. If instead you insert some delay here, say 10 minutes, 
they no longer have this, this hop up, right? Instead, they immediately start, the group, group A doesn't really change, but group A plus B uh, starts there. So it's as if they forgot B, right? They basically forgot what they were doing in B. And what that tells us a little bit is that the fast state is in fact decaying. Right, so it's decaying over time, not necessarily over trial. So in that 10 minute period, basically all of the fast state washed out, and you're just left with the slow state. Right? So you don't get that rebound, instead you just get spontaneous recovery. Does that make sense, Jerry? Okay. If you wait even longer than that, um, things tend to come down a little bit. Right? But they get closer and closer together. So over about if you test them after 24 hours later, the two curves are on top of each other. They look the same. Actually, you just observe the same thing a bit later, right? Yeah, but it, but the key is exactly we observe but the same thing. You begin from zero and you observe uh, 24 hours, or you begin at 12 hours and you observe 12, 12 more, and you observe the same thing. The so. Somewhat. Uh, Why not exactly the same? Because you can imagine that the fast state decays with some time, and the slow state state decays with some time. Right? You're a, you have a constant a, right? That decay with time. Turns out that the constants that over that 24-hour period, you can't fit a single a s and a f parameters. Everyone should have decayed to zero. They should have come back, and when they we put you in channel trials, they should have made zero output. So you wait long enough, right? You this. This whole experiment takes about five, 10 minutes, right? So if this is truly a linear model, if I make you wait 20 minutes, there's no possible way that you could have anything beyond this besides a zero state, right? You should have totally washed out. That's not what happens. If we train you up and then we send you home for 24 hours, the first trial when you come back, you, you have some retention. There's some non-zero output. So it can't just be that we observed it 24 hours later in time. There has to be some sort of switch, basically, where you stop decaying um, when we tell you to leave, or you decay slower when we tell you to leave. Does that make sense? So it's not that we're observing it just 24 hours later, because you should not have any motor output, anything beyond above zero 24 hours later, if it was truly a linear model with only two states. Does that make sense? So, um, zero is when they actually, they get 10 degrees. They do a 10 degree cicada. Yep. 10 degree right, cicada right? and 10 degree, yep. So, if then, if they're this like, even longer, like even slower state that we've learned over a lifetime, how to do a 10 degree cicada that isn't doing anything on the time scale of this experiment? Sure, so, they're just great, uh, okay. Um, so back in 2007. So back in 2007, this is this is Cording is the first author. Um, so Conrad Cording back in 2000 and I, I want to say nine, but I don't I don't know if I wrote it down. Um, 2007. Um, so this is uh, Cording et al. with Reza asked exactly that question. So what happens if you have time scales, you have many states, more than two, and some of the time scales have A and B parameters that are on the order of days, years. So if you put monkeys in a, uh, a gain-up uh, task, so initially you start with a, with a gain of, let's, let's do a gain-down task. It makes a little bit more fun. Um, so here's a gain of one, and here's a gain of 0.5. So a gain down task of, of half, right? So I make 10 degree. I ask you to make a 10 degree cicada, and then jump the target back by five degrees. So um, the the actual data is from uh, Rick Robinson at all. So over the course of 22 days, they asked, they trained monkeys to, to make these 
50 degree gain down movements. And so what happens on the first day is um, you start, you come down a little bit, maybe you're at 0.75. Then, so here's the end of day one. Here's day two. You've gone back a little bit to where you were before and you do just a little bit better. Day three, you still go back a little bit. Day four, right? And so over time you get down to, so by, by day 22, you get down to about 0.5. Does that make sense? Then what they do is they switch it back to a gain of one, pure washout. So we, put the, we ask you to make a saccade to a 10 degree target, we leave the target at 10 degrees. What ends up happening in that washout period, right, here's my gain of 0.5, my gain of 1. You started down here, and so right, you're, you're at this point here, because I've gained you down. And you start to learn, not that way, you start to learn to gain up your saccades. Interestingly enough, the forgetting is now in the other direction. You're not forgetting to a gain of one, you're now forgetting to a gain of 0.5. Which suggests that there is a short period time scale, or there's a time scale on the order of minutes, right, in which I'm learning things on the order of minutes. There's a time scale on the order of days, right, in which I forget things over days, but on subsequent days I forget less and less. Right? So I'm retaining something with a time scale of days, right? And then there's you know, a time scale of weeks, because the fact that I'm forgetting in the opposite direction says that I have now learned in my time scale of weeks that this is the appropriate action to do, not the original moment of zero. Does that make sense? So the way they model it, and you can actually model it quite easily, is they model it as, um, as now uh, a vector of states x on n plus 1 equals some matrix A uh, plus some vector B times y on trial n minus y hat on trial n, where y hat on trial n is C transpose times x, where C is equal to 1, 1, 1, 1. Right. So in this so we've, all we've done is basically extend the, the two-state model to make it have as many states as we want. In the case that they did here, they had 30 states with time scales ranging from seconds to you know, weeks. Um, and you can get, you get exactly these curves back out. The question really is, um, so A here is equal to sum A11, A22, A33, etc. So there are these off-diagonal terms, which I'm, there are things in them, I don't want to draw them as zeros. Uh, what are these off-diagonal terms? Well, if they're non, if they are zero, then all the states are independent, just like they were here, all the states are independent. But if they're something non-zero, what that means is that this state contributes to the next state on, at some period. What does that mean? Well. It means that as I learn things in the fast state, it contributes sort of incrementally to the slow, to the next slowest state, to the next slowest state, to the next slowest state. So over time, my fast memory becomes a slower memory. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, so the way that they they actually model this is they use the common filter. So you have some noise sigma, um, and you distribute sigma with uh, some variance. But all of them. But good question. But uh, yeah, time scales on the order of days to weeks. The question really is, how do you how do you come up with a? <laughs> right? You have you have thirty. This is now a thirty by thirty matrix. What is a? How do I know that it's thirty big? Right? How do I know that the number of states that I that I need to require is thirty? Um, and Reza will actually get to that in just a couple of lectures. You can use uh, subspace analysis to basically tell you exactly what a is and exactly what b is and the size of the full. I'm not going to talk about it today, but uh, that's the real question, is how do you know what those things are? Okay, so um, let me just make sure I covered everything that I needed to cover. Yes, okay, so I'm going to talk briefly, I'm going to return to this experiment right here. 
Now, if you recall, if you don't do the spontaneous recovery and you just teach them, give them the gain up task, you end up with a slope that's greater than uh, the slope you had before, and then a slope that is parallel after some number of trials uh, to what you had before. And so the question is, why, why is that the case? Clearly, any multi-state model cannot account for that. Right? In, a, in any multi-state model, the rate of learning is fixed. Right? You have some fixed B parameters. And so if you learn faster here, you should learn faster for everything. Right? Doesn't matter. Similarly, you can imagine a scenario in which exactly the same as the scenario we envisioned here, where you have a perturbation A and a period of washout where you just do null movements, null movements, exactly the same movements. So this is the, the saccade of 10 degrees. And you do the saccade of 10 degrees with a step of four. So we give you back 10 degrees. And so here you learn, here you decay, right? But let's imagine that we extend that period of washout for a really long time, right? A rather boring experiment. If you extend it for a very long time, say 10 times the length of the U-learning perturbation A, in any rate-based or, or state-based model, right, you have some input that's the error. And it, all of the states decay with some time constant. And the time constants are guaranteed to be less than one. Right? You, can't, you can't retain more than you've actually learned. You, have to, you can only retain exactly what you learned or less than what you learned. And it, so in order to have an output that's equal to zero, you basically learned null perturbations, um, all of your states have to be zero after some point in time. So after the length of A, so say this is 30 trials, since this system follows superposition, after 30 trials of washout, all of the states by definition have to be equal to zero. Does that make sense to everyone? So the fact that I gave you all of these null perturbations just means that I'm reinforcing the fact that all of the states have to be zero. Turns out that if you put people in A again, they learn a heck of a lot faster. After like an hour of washout. You gave them three minutes of it in the beginning, and then an hour of washout, and they'll still learn faster when they see it the second time. Interestingly enough, what is also funny about this paradigm is that if you expose subjects to exactly the opposite perturbation, they'll also learn faster. Um, they have never seen a negative one perturbation before, but they will learn the perturbation faster. Is this humans or monkeys? Humans do it, monkeys do it. Um, insects do it. Birds do it. Birds do it. <laughs> Birds. Yeah. Uh, so this is an example of, so in the initial case it was savings again, right? It was just a standard savings, but we just have an extended washout in there. No multi-state model can account for, for those results. This is an example of something we call meta-learning. So meta-learning, in which you have learned something about the environment, the rules of the environment. Whatever perturbation one was, I can infer what a negative perturbation is. I have learned something about the state of the environment, and by learning something about the environment, I learn faster when I see a minus one perturbation, even though I've never experienced it before. Um, and so this is where the model that Reza presented yesterday comes in. So in the case where, so, here, we only have memories of the perturbation. X hat is a memory of the state of the system, the perturbation, right? So in the way that I'm drawing them, you always approximate the perturbation that, that you're being given, right? So you approximate a perturbation A, and when I turn off that perturbation A, you're approximating null, right? The equations that Reza gave you yesterday, in which you have, even on, in a single state, X hat of N plus one equals X hat of N, in front of it, we'll say, times eta on trial n times y tilde, the error on trial n, right? Remember that you're modifying the value of eta on every trial as a basis set, right? So those weights internal to that basis set are being changed given the history of errors that you experience. So remember that in that case, we said w of n plus 1 
which is a vector, is equal to W on trial N plus some learning rate beta, some learning rate on the weights beta, times the sine of E of N and E of N minus 1 times G of E of N minus 1 uh, over G transpose E of N minus 1. So you update your weights based on the sign of the two errors that you experienced and, um, and about the error that you experienced. Does that make sense? So intuitively, what does this rule mean? Well, it, it says if I'm learning something and I learn a little bit um, and I did a little bit better, then I need to increase the, my sensitivity to error. So I made a reaching movement, I fell short. The next time I see that error again, I need to have a higher error sensitivity so that if my goal is to reach exactly to the target on the next trial, right? I need to have a slightly higher error sensitivity. However, if I reached exactly to the target, in which case E of N is going to be equal to zero, I don't want to do anything. My sensitivity to error was perfect. If I see that error again, it's set exactly right, so I'll reach and I'll make it exactly to the target. If, however, E of n minus 1 and E of n are of different signs, right? In one case, I undershot the target. In the other case, I overshot the target, which basically means I overcorrected it. I have too high of an error sensitivity. I need to bring it down um, so that on the next trial, if I ever see that error again, I reach directly to the target. That's sort of the intuition behind this rule. Basically, it says if I'm doing poorly but getting a little bit better, I need to increase sensitivity. If I'm doing poorly but getting worse, I need to decrease error sensitivity, and if I'm doing just right and reaching directly to the target, I should do nothing. Sensitivity should stay the same. So what happens here is, for this perturbation of 1, you see an error of 1. Right? On the next trial, you do a little bit better, right? because that's what your error sensitivity said. So what you do is you update your error sensitivity about an error of 1, saying, well, I didn't reach exactly to the target. In one trial, I didn't correct all. So I need a slightly higher error sensitivity the next time I see that error. So you upweight your sensitivity to error about an error of one, right? And you do the same thing as you go along. So you basically update your error sensitivities to say, oh, I did good, I just didn't do fantastic. I need to have a slightly higher error sensitivity. Now when you come back to that perturbation sometime later, those weights are all set to be exactly what they were equal to before, right? And so because you have a slightly higher error sensitivity, your eta value is larger for a perturbation of one, you'll learn faster. Right? You learn more of the error on each trial. So you'll learn faster. Does that make sense? Similarly, if you imagine the period of washout as also giving you errors, here you had an error of positive one, here you have an error of negative one. Does that make sense? Right? As soon as I switch off the perturbation, because you were estimating the perturbation pretty good, when I switch off the perturbation, you have an error in the opposite direction. You have an error of negative one. And you correct for that error by bringing your output down. Right. And it's consistent, right? You're not great. You didn't correct for the error immediately on the next trial. So you need to increase your sensitivity to error. Now not about errors of plus one, but now about errors of minus one. Does that make sense? So if you now give the opposite perturbation, you've already seen those errors, and they were here in that washout period, which is why you learn faster. You've increased your sensitivity to negative errors as well as positive errors due to the washout. Makes a couple of very strange predictions as well. Yeah? Is the slope during the washout steeper than during the learn? It is slightly steeper, uh, but that's because of the contributions of the A parameter. Right, A is less than one, so not only are you also learning, you're learning from error, but you're also forgetting simultaneously. Does that make sense? So if you removed A, if you set A equal to one, um, they, they would have exactly the same slopes. Or exactly the same exponential curve, right? Not, I guess not slope, but does that make sense? So a couple of weird predictions here. So if instead of applying the perturbation abruptly, turning it on and turning it off, what you can do is you can apply the perturbation gradually. People don't even know that you're doing it. Right? Or ramp up the perturbation. And people will follow, happily follow along. Uh, have no idea that you're doing anything. 
Um, for instance, you can do a gain up experiment, and you can gain them up instead of applying the 4 degree area, you apply 0.1, you know, 0.1 degree area, 0.2. People will happily follow you right along, think they're making a totally normal move. Uh, even though at the end, they're making, they're, they're approximating exactly the perturbation. Here though, you never experience a large error, right? You never experience an error about one, right? You experience very small errors, the difference between what your estimated output is and the perturbation on average trial, right? So very minuscule errors. And so you're updating errors, your error sensitivity near errors of zero not near errors of one. So if you come back later and you test them with an abrupt perturbation, they don't learn any faster than controls. They learn exactly as fast as if they had never seen the perturbation before, even if you make them learn it over a very long period of time, an even longer period of time than, um, than the abrupt people learned it. Does that make sense? So in that x hat of n plus 1 equals a x blah, blah, blah. So that's the same as last, or as in the homework, except for that a term is added here, right? Yeah, in the homework, uh, as I said, it makes life a lot easier if you assume a is equal to 1. Yeah. You, you can make it not equal to 1, and you'll see how things change. It, it changes. The, the difference when a is not equal to 1 is that if you give a null perturbation, or if you give a, I'm sorry, a unit perturbation, the difference is you won't approximate the perturbation exactly, right? You'll have some error at the end, right? You won't learn fully because on every trial you forget a little bit. Right, right, right. And then so, and then the added term is that eta of the error in y, or is that this eta function times so the error in y? It is. So is that is eta still a coefficient, or is eta? It, in the, it, this is exactly identical to the homework. It's a function of y tilde, but in this case, it's also multiplied by y tilde, right? Yeah. So, so okay. it is a function of y tilde. I don't know how you how you want me to know function times y tilde. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is. It's exactly the same as as the homework, right? You see an error. You ask, what is the sensitivity about that error? Mm -hmm. You pull it from the sum mm -hmm. of the Gaussian <laughs> bases. And you multiply by the error. Okay. Right. So in all, in the homework as well, I do not put this extra set of parentheses with an error in there because then that means the error is squared. Uh, I, I don't know how to denote this is a function of error, and this is being multiplied by error. So I usually drop the function and just write it as multiplied. And the key difference is that I say eta on trial n, right, as opposed to just eta, a constant eta. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, the notation is, I, I don't know how to, how, how to write the function as a function. Yeah. I think it's just it's the parentheses that are confusing. So if, like, if there was just a, like a oh, oh, asterisk okay. between, that would be unambiguous. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Because the g is a function at the bottom of the g. <laughs> yeah, this is a function. 